welcome back. Yeah, yes, welcome back. I'm Alfred Lamarant Weber, and um, we have the extraordinary privilege today to have uh, not only UFO researcher, but now I have to say explorer and discoverer, okay. <laughs> adding to his many accomplishments along with author Robert M. St Stanley. Welcome, Robert. Thanks for having me back, Alfred. Well, um, Robert is not only the author of two very significant books in our field, Close Encounters on Capitol Hill and Covert Encounters in Washington, D.C. Robert has now published uh, photographs and articles and analysis on two significant discoveries. Uh, in and off of Malibu, California, which is his hometown, and where these discoveries are, uh, that in my judgment, as will unfold in the course of this program, are very significant uh, to the to the to the history of this planet. Right. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Robert. Tell us how you first came across these discoveries to, and what they are. Okay. Well, you know, you and I have talked about the Archons before at length, and I, and I appreciate you giving me that platform to talk about it. But that's where the story begins. It's September 21st, 1985, at a private beach in Malibu where I was a security guard. And I was attacked by these airborne parasites that, you know, Gnostics called them the Archons. Apparently, all the different tribes around the world called them different things, and they, but they were aware of them, or are aware of them, I should say. Um, and I had no idea what was going on. So, as a result of that attack, I was motivated to go up to a mountaintop and meditate or pray, whatever you want to call it. I was sitting there during the uh, equinox, and um, I had an out-of-body experience, and I entered a realm of light. That's all I can tell you. I was in every. I was floating in the light, and and while I was there, a being came up to me who was extremely. I mean, he was he was glowing. You, you see the picture on the website. There's a. It's hard to describe, but I mean, there was light coming out of his eyes, and his whole body was just light. Um, and I looked at him and I said, "Whoa." who is that? I, I was just asking, it's just rhetorical, like, what, what, who is that? I'm thinking. And he said, I am the father. And I, and it didn't make any sense to me um, at all at the time. I was so shocked by, first of all, seeing this guy. I'd never seen anybody like that before. And, um, uh, well, he didn't look like my father. I, I wasn't sure if he said the father or my father, but any, in any case, I was utterly baffled by what this guy was uh, doing there and wherever we were and um, <laughs> the, it, he started laughing I remember the next thing was I guess I was so perplexed by his appearance and and uh, having you know him right in my face like that I it, he just started laughing at me and uh, for whatever reason and um, the next thing I knew I was waking up I really thought I was just having a weird vision and that um, Oh, I should back up. I had meditated there for hours on that mountain, and um, I had not prepared for this, okay? It was all spontaneous. I was running on instinct um, because I was under attack and um, uh, didn't know where to get help for something like this. I didn't even know what these things were that were attacking me, to tell you the truth. <clears throat> so um, when I'm up there meditating for hours. I've, I've got, I felt tired, so I, just, I thought I would lay down for a while and, and, and regenerate a little bit before... Uh, going back home, even though it was the middle of the night, I figured I'd just, you know, I'll probably go home, but I'm too t I was too tired to ride my motorcycle back off the mountain safely. So I laid down on this cement area, and uh, the next thing I know, I just, it was, I floated right out of my body. And, um, but I was completely awake, you know, it wasn't like I was, 
It wasn't like I was sleeping long enough. I wasn't even asleep. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I laid down, and, and moments later, I was just floating out of my body with the full, full awareness of, of what was happening to me. So it wasn't a lucid dream. Um, but I still thought when I woke when I woke up, I thought, God, that was a weird uh, vision of some kind. You know, I mean, how else could you explain that, right? But then I looked up at the moon. The moon was now almost setting. It, when I when I first laid down, it was it was pretty much overhead. So I, then I thought, Oh my God, hours have gone by. How is that possible? How could I? Did I fall asleep? I didn't feel like I fell asleep. I mean, the, it was just. None of that made sense, Alfred. I, in fact, I remember getting up and being wide awake and walking around and kind of like talking to myself, like, "What was that? Who was that? Where, where, where have I been? All this, you know, hours have gone by. It doesn't make it. None of this made any sense to me at all." Um, and uh, of course, I'm summarizing a lot of the events, you know, that we've talked about in great detail about these things. But that's the reason I went back up to the mountains was because I was looking to see if I could if I, if I could talk to this guy or see him again. Um, I mean, obviously, I know there's not, like, you don't just walk off the mountain into a realm of light, but I was kind of, that was my, that again, that was the only motivation I had for going back up to the mountain, this time during the daytime. And uh, I didn't, for some reason, I didn't go back to the same spot. I was pulled to the next mountain peak over, and I went, so I walked, I parked my bike and I rode all, uh, excuse me, I rode my bike there, parked, walked up this long road and I got to the top of that road and it, I, was, I was in shock all over again because here was this giant face, at least 300 feet tall and you, you can see it on the website, it looks like a sphinx. From where I was standing, okay, the sphinx is like, if, is in profile, if you're looking at it, you know, like this. You can see the profile, but I was looking at it at a slight tangent, and it looked like a, almost like a Neanderthal face. Enormous human face, though. And I looked at that, and I had such a powerful deja vu that I just, like, I was just there by myself, but I felt, I didn't feel alone either. Uh, I, I felt like I was being watched, and I couldn't really explain it, but the next thing I did was I found myself running to that place. When, where the this giant face was, I again, I this was all spontaneous, and I'm just running over there, sweating, and I didn't even have water with me. I mean, it's just it's crazy, and and I got to the top of that, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, I I started having memories of when I was a kid growing up in Malibu. It, it was starting to come back to me. Uh, 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 these these now these were lucid dreams. When I was a kid, I moved to Malibu when I was two. And that was, I think it was 1962, actually. I moved out there. And um, uh, I, that's when I first saw this location, but I never got to go there. I, I, I was close, but I never got to actually physically go there. I was just a child. My parents, you know, whatever. And at that time, it was owned by the Boy Scouts. And I was not a Boy Scout. I, I, I joined the Indian Guides. <laughs> Don't ask me why. But that was my thing, okay? So... But we, we never went... I, I know other people that went there as Boy Scouts, but I don't think that was part of the... Uh, scouting experience as far as I know. Anyway, uh, when I went there in 1985, I saw that face and I uh, started to have this uh, deja vu of, wait a minute, I know this place. I've seen it in my dreams many times. It was I was either with the Shumash Indians in my dreams or I was with these other people. And you know, after 1985, I kept, I started going back there on a regular basis and I started bringing people there I was, and I had took pictures and I was even showing people, you know, do you, I say, do you see the face in this stone? And they said, yeah, where is that, uh, Cambodia? And I'd say, no, no, it's Malibu. And they, 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 they were totally skeptical. They could, they couldn't believe it, you know? And, um, so, uh, you know, over the years I've taken different people up there, but only recently have people become very excited because the other component here is the UFO activity there. As I was up there exploring the ruins and bringing friends with me, especially at night, I, I'm not sure why we ended up spending so many nights up there, um, but we did. And that's when we had multiple close encounters between 1985 and mm, 1993. I have really a lot of encounters, very close, very personal. Sometimes they were beaming lights down on us. 
And from when I say the encounter, the, on top of the, the head of the Sphinx, it's, it's flat. And that's where we would camp. And it's, um, <laughs> if you were to go directly out into the ocean from that mountain peak, you'd be right on top of that anomaly that some people are claiming is a UFO base. So when I first heard about it uh, in 2014, I, it's because a lot of people said, hey, um, somebody's, somebody's trying to claim that's a UFO base. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh, I, I, I found that back in 2010 on Google Maps. But I called it a platform. I didn't ever think it was, um, I never associated it with being a UFO base. Um, I thought it was part of the ruins. You know, I, I mean, it looks man-made. It looks artificial. It's, it's too symmetrical to be a natural, uh, whatever it is, to uh, what I've come to realize just this week. There's no erosion on it. There's erosion around it. But the thing itself, it looks, it looks too perfect. Um, if that was a mound that had been built like, you know, some of the other mounds that we see, the Indian mounds, um, uh, made out of dirt and rock and trees, that, it should have eroded by now at that depth. You know, there are currents there. They're slow, but they do move. So the other thing was after I, uh, one of the things I did was I, I found some artifacts during about the same time I was, you know, finding the ruins and doing my research there, searching for answers. Uh, I was also given some artifacts. I, I mean, they obviously belong to the Shumash, but um, one of the things when I, I actually returned a very important artifact, and it was an extremely large steatite bowl that they had used for ceremonies and I found it and I returned it to them and that created a dialogue uh, between us and uh, I, so I showed him the pictures of these monuments in, uh, up in the mountains and I said do you know anything about this and they said yeah that that would have been the, from the first people okay I'd never heard that before what do you mean the first people so, and they said they were wiped out in a flood they were destroyed I think they said they were turned to mud. I think that's what he said. They literally were wiped out. Um, so, in any case, there's, there are uh, a, a, not only are there a lot of UFO sightings there, but we have that we I, on my website there, which I've shown you, there are astronomical artifacts that that have been discovered there. Um, one of them is never been seen in the Americas before. It's only known in the Middle East as a cylinder seal. And I remember when Zachariah Sitchin was alive and I showed it to him one time, uh, he, he, he almost fell out of his chair because I said, oh, it's, you know, I this is from, he, we were at LAX at the time. I said, this is from Malibu. It's only, you know, like 30 miles from here. And, he just, he, he absolutely was shocked. He, what he told me, though, he says, you must find more of these. <laughs> I, I was like, really? Okay. Well, he was actually right, though. He was right about that because when a, another visit that I had with a Shumash elder, I said, you know, uh, um, you know I'm the guy that, that, that returned this, this bowl to your people. And I said, I have a question for you about this artifact. And I showed him the bead, and oh my God, it was way worse. For, I mean, the, his reaction was much more startling than Zachary Sitchin. He he had a visceral, uh, uh, you know, like uh, he went into shock. Basically, he, the he, he, the the hair on his arm stood up. He told me, he says, "I don't know how you got this." I says, "I don't know why you have this." I didn't know what he was talking about, you know, and um, and then he started to tell me about this secret society that was actually the rulers of the, or the leaders of the Shumash nation for thousands of years before the Spanish came in under the Franciscan Brotherhood and, and basically uh, outlawed, <laughs> they outlawed that so-called religion. It was far more than that, okay? But anyway, um, uh, at the time I didn't realize that the bead was not just a bead. I could see there were star symbols on it, but I did at that point. I didn't really even think that you were supposed to roll it across wet clay to make a uh, a star map. But he he did tell me that um, the, the the Shumash didn't fear anything in life except the on top, because they were just they were so different and they were so knowledgeable about so many things 
and uh, they really were in charge. You, you didn't ever question them, and it was weird. The way he was describing it, I'd never even heard of them. Uh, I, I knew the Shumash were very mysterious or a little understood tribe, but um, when he started telling me about the the Antop, he also, also cautioned me. He says, "Do not ever tell anyone that you have this this object." He says, "Because there are people in my tribe. What's left of my people? There are individuals that would kill you to possess that object." I'm like, you know, why? Why? Why would you even, you know? It was a gift to me. I, I don't know why you would. Any, any, and he said, because if they had that, they would be assumed to be an on top, even if they're not, you know. And uh, that was part of the, the, the puzzlement for him. It's like, how in the world did I get this? And uh, why didn't I know? I mean, if I had it, how come I didn't know? How could I be so ignorant? Um, and uh, actually... He showed me how to pr pr care for it properly. It was really mm. interesting. I had it in a different medicine bag at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and he says, you, you really need to put that with some sage. And he says, I've got, I have, I have some, some bundles of sage over in that bowl. Why don't you get one and put it in your medicine bag? I said, okay. I, I, and I walked over there and there was in the bowl, there, it was beautiful, this wooden bowl that they had made. And, um, uh, on, uh, on um, one of them was already singed on the tip, and I so I took that one. He said, "Hey, why did you take that one?" And I said, "I don't know. It just felt right." And he goes, "Did you know that that's the one I used to bless all the other ones?" And I said, "No." And he goes, "He says you surprised me. <laughs> you really surprised me. I mean, it was." It was a shock for both of us, okay? I mean, really, it was so weird the way all this has happened, Alfred. It doesn't, I mean, it, that's why it's taking me a long time to actually come forward with this story. Not only was I trying to understand it, but I didn't think anybody would believe this. It's, it really sounds like something fictional, and that's why I was originally writing it as a novel, because I just figured nobody would believe it. I could hardly believe it. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, no, I mean, now you've published photographs of all of the artifacts yeah. and and we will have links to the uh to the web pages with with all the artifacts thank you in the video description here so Thanks. while viewers are viewing the you know our conversation and you explaining they they can go and open windows and actually see yeah you know the 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 uh, different artifacts. Now, let me just go back a second. Go ahead. And and um, uh, maybe uh, I'm I'm just looking at a different. Um, uh, starting first with the with the monuments. Right. We and these are monumental size. <laughs> yeah. And. And we're going to have links links to that. Um, how old do you think these are? Well, it's a good question. I, don't, I can't give you a date certain on this, but we do know that the Shumash, based on the um, uh, they call the forensic evidence, uh, as far as uh, you know, human remains that the Shumash have been in that area for at least 11,000 years. So whoever the first people were that created that would have had to been at least 11, 12,000 years ago or more uh, that they were e existing there. And um, obviously a lot of erosion has occurred on these monuments and the walls uh, that are left there. And uh, so that's why some people are having a hard time. They're just saying they're attributing these human faces in the rock there's three of them in one lo little location small lo it's all very centrally located uh to itself uh, there some people are trying to say that that's just the work of erosion and again i've never seen anything like that before in nature so i would disagree strongly with that right now let me jump to an uh just a different question before getting into the the individual artifacts. Okay. If, 
if we jump over to the undersea, uh, to the undersea um, uh, ruins, yeah. which which you've you've set that up and you show that they're in alignment. Yes, in some sort of alignment with the monuments. Absolutely. Um, what age do you estimate? I mean, are they the same age? Were they, you say, both above sea level and then when the great flood happened, they yeah. went under sea? Is yeah, that what yeah. happened? Right. That's what I was told, that the, the first people lived in a valley just off the coast, a coastal valley that was flooded. And uh, I've got some very crude maps of that. I've also got some very good maps of it. But, uh, you know... Um, if that was a man-made structure, it wasn't built underwater. You know, uh, some people try to speculate. How'd they do that? How'd they build it underwater? Well, they're obviously not, you know, mermaids. They, they would have built it when it was still above the water. And, and then at, during the flood, yes, that's pro that, that would have to be what happened. There's a lot of things like that are, that are underwater from different periods of time. But, you know, you know the other thing is, if people are skeptical or they're interested, hopefully they're more interested than skeptical, the way to deal with this is to go to my website and uh, use the link to the, uh, the, the trail map. I mean, this is the first right. time I've ever done this. Now anybody who wants to can go there without having to ask me for permission. For a long time, I would only give it out if somebody wrote to me and said, how do I get there, depending on who they were, what they wanted to do. I was trying to protect the place for you know, as long as I could. But I really feel like now is the time to just throw the door op wide open and let anybody who wants to go there, because uh, it is open to the public, you just really wouldn't know how to get there and see these things unless I give you uh, the, the trail map, which I've marked, as well as the driving instructions on how to get there. Anybody can go there. I would caution, though, that it is strenuous. If you want to see the whole thing, it's it's going to take you hours to to hike along the trail up and back um, and it can get pretty hot in the summer the trails sometimes are slippery and there are there's things like poison oak and rattlesnakes and whatever so you gotta be, be aware of the fact you really are in a wilderness area up there but the reason I want the other reason I want people to go there I used to give tours I used to give hiking tours of this place uh, and it's it's so different than looking at pictures granted the pictures I have put up there are the best I've I've done so far in the last 20 something years but it doesn't you, you they pale in comparison to actually being there because these monuments are so big uh, and there's there's a an energy there's a there's a remnant energy or consciousness of the place like I said it almost feels haunted like you're being watched or if you're sensitive at all you'll connect with it you'll know you'll know exactly what I mean when you get there is a, a very very ancient presence in in that place right uh, just going back to the issue of of the age I, I I like to bring up this kind of correlation because it's something that we've been studying in 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 connection with our uh, studies of life on Mars mm. which is our nearest solar neighbor and uh, from uh, and we've now interviewed five separate, five independent uh, whistleblowers who are Mars experiencers. That is, who have been to Mars, and some of whom have interacted directly with the different human and other civilizations on Mars. Wow. And, and we've done a lot of um, research on that s subject. And this is why I'm bringing it up. That uh, one of the uh, theories there that, that, that we've put forth is that of a solar system catastrophe. Right. Which occurred around 11,500 years ago. In other words, 9,500 B.C. Yeah. And that solar system catastrophe was when a fragment of the Vela supernova came into the solar system. It hit uh, more squarely on Mars and turned it into an oblate planet, 
like a pumpkin, so it's not perfectly round. Yeah. And that uh, partially destroyed its surface ecology and part of the atmosphere. And that's why there's no real vegetation. You know, it's very sparse on Mars and why the, uh, the main human uh, civilization on Mars that we call Homo Martis Terrace, which are our, like, our cousins. Right. Prior to this, Earth and Mars were a single interplanetary society, mm. a single interplanetary human society under the rulership of the predecessors to the Egyptian pharaohs. Wow. That's why we have <coughs> both Earth and Mars are pyramidal cultures, and you find pyramids on both. I mean, the, yeah. Mars is full of pyramids, Earth is full of pyramids all over Asia, Middle East, South America. It's all precedes the solar system catastrophe. Right. And some fragments of the, you know, of this glanced on Earth, not as much as on Mars, so, but enough to destroy the great maritime civilization that we had that had various names, Mu, Atlantis, or, you know, whatever. And that, so that what we're seeing in the Malibu portion there was around 11,500 BC was when we had that solar system catastrophe. And that particular site, we're seeing where those giant artifacts and then that portion that's now under the ocean right off Malibu Beach right that all got that's under the ocean but that and then right after that is when the Shumash came back and they say that they were created after the first people right right yeah, yeah by the gods somehow put them there yeah. it's kind of weird too they say they put them on the islands out there and then they they were making too much noise I, it's well, kind of well, 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 well. Think about it. Who are the gods? Yeah. The ETs. So yeah. The ETs came in and evacuated them, and oh. then brought them back. Brought them back after the flood. Some of them, yes, so, I so, can see that. So, so, some of them, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's certainly possible. Uh, but the, it's it's so strange when they talk about their mythology of creation there that that when they were put on the island, at some point the goddess that put them there said, "You, you guys are making too much noise. Go over to the mainland." Well, they didn't know how. They, she, she made a rainbow bridge for them to cross. That's very weird. <laughs> if you think about it, why not just put them over there? No, that she had to create this energy bridge. Yeah. And, you know that they could walk across in the sky. I mean, that is very weird. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and these are folk memories of some yeah. paranormal event that yeah. that that the ETs probably. Created some 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 kind of teleportation, maybe something something maybe, that, like maybe a yeah yeah may, maybe they were teleported across. Oh 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 oh! Wait a yeah. minute! One of the experiences I had up there on that mountain with my most of the time I was with my friends, different friends up there. Uh, one night we were up there and we were looking due west out over the water at night, and and I had a sensation that they were uh, somebody was there. Again, when the when the UFOs are around, you it's 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 weird. It, I mean, you, you could just if you're sensitive to it, you can feel it. And um, I was telling my buddies, I think they're here. And then at some point, they a ship just it, it was obviously there, cloaked, okay, with the light off. But it turned. It was it was off to my right. I remember, and I, it, it turned on the light, and it slowly moved in front of us, okay? And as it did this, it was, it was circular, and there was a, you could see there was just a, uh, just a tremendously powerful energy field around the craft, and it looked like a sparkler. The air was just going crazy around this thing. And, um, but it was totally silent. And it moved from the right to the left. It went from white to red, yellow, blue, green, purple, and then, blink, it was gone again. Or, I mean, visually. I knew it was still there, and oh my God, I was so <clears throat> I was so excited. I mean, I don't know if it was adrenaline or, or the electricity that was in the air or whatever, but I mean, I, I was just, we were all kind of just like freaked out 
absolutely freaked out by that. So maybe that's what the Shumash saw way back all those years ago was they call it a rainbow bridge, but it could have been a rainbow craft of some kind. Who right. knows? Yeah, yeah, a, 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 exactly. But now here we have the solar system catastrophe. Yeah. And it occurs around 11,500 years yeah. ago. Yeah. It fits in perfectly with the Shumash, with the Shumash, um, uh, you know, timing, their history. Uh, and not only that, it's occurring here on Earth. It's occurring throughout the entire solar system. It's yeah. occurring on Mars. Right. Because now, as this generation of Earthling humans is for the first time linking up with this generation of Marthli Martian humans, mm. it's all coming together. Yeah. It's because at the 3D level, all the 3D civilizations that were at effect of this solar system catastrophe are now awakening and coming up. Yeah. Now in in you know at this time and 2014 I I I agree with you seems to be a particularly in, in impactful time. Yeah. So I just wanted to point that out. Now Good. let me go over here and I just want to bring and we will have uh if, if pe people can just go to that link that says um that that uh says the megalithic mo the megalithic monuments and we're going to the one that says Brahma's head. Yeah. Okay. About what are the dimensions of that Brahma's head? It's about 100 feet high. I've never actually measured it, so I'm just guesstimating. But the thing is, it's the where it's sitting on top of this cliff structure is very terraced. Um, it look when you're down low trying to approach it, it looks like you're looking at a skyscraper. It's enormous. The complex is, is huge. Everything they did was on a massive scale, um, you know, including that platform that's out under the water. That thing is miles, miles wide. Um, but yeah, the, the balancing rock, a lot of people say, uh, how could that possibly be sitting there after all the earthquakes? Um, well, even though it's cut, I mean, I'm, excuse, excuse me, if it's balancing like this, it's, it looks like to me like it's been cut around the base. But it's still, I think it's still connected. In other words, it was an outcropping of some kind that they sculpted, but it, it's probably still connected directly to the cliff itself. Um, and it's, it's an optical illusion, too. I haven't put up all the photos yet. I'm still working on the website. My, my, unfortunately, my computer died in the process, so I have to, I'll start again tomorrow. But, but there's a lot more pictures I'm going to put up there. All right? And that's why I'm posting at the top that every time I update it, you'll see at the top what date it was. So... But um, from a certain angle, it looks like it should just fall off. It looks like you would go up and just touch it, and it should just fall off of there. But in fact, from another angle, you see it's completely, completely solidly fixed. I mean, it, it, it's very strange. Now, uh, this is just a thought, but you, okay. you call it, um, if I go to the top, it says, uh, it says the megalithic monuments of uh, Mu, correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, Mu would be in in the Pacific, so it would extend to the Indian Ocean, so it would extend to the Indian subcontinent. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where Brahma kind of yeah. is. So, yeah. because then you would say, well, why would you have sort of a Brahma head? Well, yeah. there is an historical lineage then to whatever was happening in Mu I mean I, this is speculation but at least yeah. Yeah. you know that that whatever reached into the Indian subcontinent because there's a markedly Indian thing here yes it does look Asian yeah and in fact it's facing due west towards the valley of the Mu mm -hmm. and um, it, it, the, the reason I just call it, Brahma is a, a fairly well-recognized figure in history, uh, but there are uh, uh, his what's so-called myth of Rama flying around in a Vimana, uh, and he also wore one of those helmets, 
um, you know, he was an avatar, yeah. right? I, I think today we would call him an aviator if he was flying around. So I kind of think that helmet structure wasn't just ornate. It, or, you know, ceremonial. I think it might actually have served a purpose of some kind. Yeah, and, and, and if we look at, it, at the photo of it, in the midst of the mountains, it's just kind of there as this monument. It's, it's just, it sticks I mean, out. It's, it, it's not a feature of the mountain at all. No, there's other things out there that stick up, but they're just a, they're, I haven't put that up yet, but it's, it, it look, it's just like a piece of stone sticking up here that's like a, a, a it hasn't been sculpted. It just it looks like a spindle is what I'm yeah. saying. There's other things like that, but I, you know, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So right next to it is that other face that I just called the Buddha. It's not a Buddha face, okay? These things would predate. If I'm using those names because it's what people can relate to in yeah. our modern history. Yeah. But the other one right next to it. So you got the balancing rock, and then you got this other monument right next to it. It looks like a Buddha face. I'm not saying it's Buddha, but it looks. It has that very Asian sort of puffy features and again they're very badly eroded but it, it, it it's like they're they're right next to each other okay in that one little area of what I believe used to be a temple of some kind that was connected to a larger city because see that was the thing when I had these lucid dreams um, I couldn't find I couldn't the only thing I could relate it to was Greeks because the way they were dressed in these white toga type garments and, and, and sandals and they had ships I thought, you know, uh, well, maybe I'm just thinking of Greeks for some reason. I couldn't quite, it didn't make a lot of sense, okay, especially as a child. There was no context. But I do remember sometimes, um, and I mean, this happened a lot. I called that place, I called it my night school because I would go up there as a child in my spirit body and um, uh, there was rooms there as well as these weird statues and there was people there, and we would have these take these classes of some kind. Or so, in other words, I was getting some kind of instruction even as a child, as if I recall that correctly. And and somehow I related it to the the naval base. Like if I had to put, if I ha I'm all, I don't know. I'm just really nuts about um, orientation on a map. It's just something I learned at an early age to to always know where you are on a map. And so in my dreams, I was looking for landmarks, and the military base was a very prominent, you know, landmark. And, but the hard part for me was detangling, um, you know, when I was with the Shumash, as opposed to these other people, it seemed so different. I mean, I could be in the same place, but it was just completely different. And that was, was very difficult for me. But as you know from people who spoke about, that you spoke to about time traveling, right? I mean... You, the place that you and I are sitting right now, 100 years ago, was totally different. 100 years in the future, <laughs> this house, this computer, this chair, all that's gone. It's something completely different. So when you think of it that way, it, it, it kind of makes sense. Right. Now, looking at the Buddha's head, mm. again, what are the dimensions of that? You, it's, you... it's a little larger. It's uh, about 150 feet tall. Uh-huh. It's so it's a, you know, it's a, it is, and it, you know, the other thing about the balancing rock, when you get to that one point where you're sort of in between the balancing rock and a Buddha head and you're standing there looking at the profile of the balancing rock, it's proportional to a human head. That's the other weird thing about it. Uh, it's, it, it seems so, so well thought out, you know, as, yeah. as, as a way to relate to the so-called God. Yeah, yeah. You know, but but these but but the I must say that there's a remarkable uh, symmetry yeah. between this site and similar sites. This is a field. Let's call it exoarchaeology. <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> That's good. Uh, between this site and sites that we're discovering on Mars. Yeah. Of of outdoor sculpture like this. Yeah. Of yeah. megalithic sculpture. Yeah. It's well, very... It's and, 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 and the outdoor sites on Mars and these outdoor sites would have been affected and destroyed or damaged yeah. by the same solar system event. Yeah, absolutely. So, solar system catastrophe. And they're of the same 
interplanetary society, the Mars Earth interplanetary society. Yeah, I they, agree. They they just happen to be, you know, like you have the, the societies on both planets. Yeah. You know, it's it's so it's a similar society. Yeah, and actually, we know for sure Mars had a very large ocean or oceans. Yeah spread out at one point and that all got vaporized they say millions of years ago but it doesn't doesn't we don't know that for sure we don't know exactly when it happened but it definitely happened. and we also know that this planet went through a flood stage a major flood uh, or rapidly uh, changing climate at which uh, ended an ice age and so that would explain why there was such massive flooding and also why there was such a huge huge reduction of the population here uh, I think I think if people look at the Younger Dryas event, is what they call it, that this is actually a very good uh, connection to or a description of what we're dealing with here. I'll tell you something else too: the vegetation and all the animal life changed dramatically after that. Uh, if you look at I, you know, I still marvel at some of the stuff they're pulling out of the La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. You look at their website at the uh, vegetation and the and the animal life it was unbelievable honestly you know you had you had elephants you had really you had tigers or saber-toothed tigers i mean it was just this is not the flintstones people we're talking about real animals right. that lived in los angeles prior to all this nonsense before it was turned into a desert you know it was a lush 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 place exactly now let's come to the to the first artifact, the 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 famous one that kind of knocked you over. Yeah, and I and I think that you you, you spoke about its uh, its dimensions. It mm. was how how and I'm and I'm looking at various photographs of it, which are on the website. Which again, go to go to the video de de description. And you'll see yeah. the the artifacts linked there yeah how um what are the dimensions of this artifact it's rather small it's probably about this big <laughs> i i know i mean no it really is but you but the, you're talking about the the bead right no 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 oh i'm the sorry sphinx oh the sphinx i'm sorry i thought you were yeah that was the no, first no. thing i saw you right no, um yeah the sphinx is about 300 feet tall yeah and it's really, a, a, that is a total enigma because even people who are skeptical look at that. Even my son, he said, God, that looks like a lion, Dad. Yeah. You know, I, and he doesn't know he doesn't know about this. He doesn't care about this stuff. But that's what his impression was as a teenager. Um, uh, and like I said, that seems to be a, a beacon or a honing. You know how they say there's places like uh, Bell Rock in Sedona has a, is a vortex? It's shaped like that. It has a very round feature to it. Uh, when you get on top of it, it has a, it's a, that red sandstone, a lot of iron in it. And um, it, it definitely, you feel the energy. People who are sensitive have had some very, very weird, ex you know, sensitive experiences there. Uh, uh, and like I said, that's, that seems to be the spot. If you really want to have a close encounter, at least it used to be, that was, that was a good place for it. Now, um they're, they're just some other public sculpture, for example, a white triangle yeah. and, and some, uh, uh, some other public sculpture like a, a uh, faces on uh, cliffs, an old woman that's 200 feet tall yeah. near, near the Sphinx. Yeah. Could you just talk about those a bit? Yeah, there's, I, like I said, I haven't even put them all up there. And... I think at some point I really need to draw a better map for people, but I do have some maps of where these things are in relationship to each other and to also that weird platform thing under the water. Um, but yeah, there looks like, from the Sphinx, you can see this other thing looks like an old woman face, very very badly eroded, but it's still, it has the human features. Um, the, the, as you're hiking up the trail to get to the Sphinx to the top, just before you, you really start to ascend, it's really weird. It's terraced everywhere up there. But as you approach the base of where the, like this part of the, of the, of the Sphinx would be, there, that's where that, that, that perfect white triangle is, is there. And it's, it's not painted on there. It's, it's some sort of quartz that's included into the rock. And it's, you could tell it's been uh, incised. 
In other words, somebody uh, detailed it uh, around that that white triangle. They 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 made it more prominent by uh, etch, you know, uh, carving into the rock a little bit. It's a piece of the cliff that fell down. I'm not sure how they did that, but uh, I'm not that. I mean, obviously, it could have fallen off, but I know I don't know how that thing ended up being there. So again, it's perfectly geometrical in triangle in shape. That don't <laughs> that, that usually doesn't happen in nature and you don't see it anywhere else on the cliffs there right you know and it just so happens that a lot of sh you know spacecraft kind of look like that you know i mean if you had to make a little like um, uh you know how uh, these days the universal sign language of stop and walk and it's sort of like you know spaceship here <laughs> it's like it's, that's the way we interpret it spaceport of some kind now just um Shifting over to the star map, yeah, which is on a Shumash cylinder seal. Is yeah. that it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you were saying that that what that's about it, this? It's long? about this big. Yeah, yeah, I mean, not more than two inches. Yeah, maybe more than two inches long, um, and about the circumference of a quarter. And it is. It is a bead. I mean, you can wear it as a bead. I did at first. I mean, when I acquired it, it was uh, it was really strange. I got to tell you something else. I care. I always these. Uh, this is the com <laughs> counterpart to the bead. All right. It's a uh, it's a it's a piece of serpentine. It was it's it's in the onyx family. It it was it's a, it was a trade item that the Shumash probably acquired from uh, tribes down in uh, like the Aztecs down in Mexico. Um, because it's volcanic in nature, and that it's not naturally occurring up in that area, and we know that they traded all kinds of stuff. But anyway, the reason I was so intrigued by this is when I first picked it up, I real I saw that and it, you can't see it here, but it it has a small, uh, what looks like a fish. Well, they call it a fish hook, but it, it to us we I saw it. I thought, oh my God, that's the letter, that's a capital J carved in there. What you know? What in the heck? How who would do that? It's, it, it really is the symbol of fish hook. It's also associated with this constellation of Scorpius. Uh, but in any case, I found this rock, and um, I was working at the beach at the time. And I, and I had this in my pocket, and I was really intrigued by it. And I saw some of the local kids there that I was friends with, and um, uh, I, I showed it to him. And, he, and he, I said, hey, I found this down the beach where you, you used to live. And he goes, oh, I got a whole coffee can full of those in my in my bedroom I said really oh wow um, can I take a look at them and he said yeah come on over after work and I'll show it so uh, go there and he dumps out the coffee can full of rock and, and in the, there was the bead I mean there was a bunch wow. of these. there was a you know there was a bunch of these right and I completely lost interest in the rocks because when he I saw the bead I said to him oh God, you know, uh, uh, where'd you get that? Africa? I mean, because it didn't look like anything I'd seen of a Shumash artifact before. And he said, no, no, I found it down there with the, you know, with the rocks. Well, I said, well, hey, you, you know, you, you shouldn't be keeping this in a coffee can with the rocks. I said, this thing is priceless. And he says, well, here, you take it. I mean, he was a 13-year-old kid, okay? His friend, my, yeah, I was 25 or whatever. And he's like, hey, you like it? Here, go. I just, <laughs> you know, it was just been sitting in a coffee can for years. Wow. So um, I said to him, no, 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 no. I, I, I mean, thank you, but, I, I, you know, really, this thing belongs in a museum. And he says, okay, then you, and he, t he literally took it and put it in my hand. He, you have it. And then he turned around and just, you know, like, hey, we're done. And I was <laughs> standing there looking at it, just thinking, what, what, oh, God. I mean, it was weird. The, 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 the vibe I got off of it, I just, I was shocked, literally. Like, once again, I was shocked. It's like, that didn't, that, that, I didn't see that coming, okay? Uh, and, and I saw, I, I, I didn't know what else to do with it. I, 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 mean, I put it into a, into a necklace. I wore it. And a lot of people said to me, <laughs> like my girlfriend she says you know that looks like a turd that you know it, <laughs> so, well uh oh i well it's not okay it's an ancient artifact i mean that much i knew and uh at the time so 
I, I stopped wearing it, which is probably a good thing, but I never ever gave up that, uh, whatever that connection I had with it. Um, and it, you know, I always keep it with this because honestly, if you look up in the night sky, it's all dark, right? And then the bead is the stars. Oddly enough, now th this, like I said, I had that bead for, I don't know, 15, 16 years before I realized that, wait a minute, that needs to be rolled across wet clay. I think I was reading a lot of Sitchin's books at the time, and that's probably where it occurred to me. Uh, you need to roll it across wet clay in order to see the three stars. Right. And that's what's there is an impression I actually made with that bead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which you can see. Yeah, I didn't, which but... Which I'm looking at now. Originally, I had it flipped. When I looked at it, I was reading it backwards, and that's why I couldn't figure out what star system or constellation that was up until this year. I was watching a program. They were talking about the history or the mythology of, or the, the belt of Orion. And as I'm watching that, I just went, oh, my God, how did I miss that? It's so obvious, the three stars in a row. So that's the belt of Orion. It not only it, it, it's a really good representation as far as the alignment of the stars is not perfect, and the size of each one is a little bit different, and yet that's all depicted in that map. So they either really had really good vision, or they had something to magnify the vision, or or this is where it gets really weird. Only this year did I finally realize it was the belt of Orion, and then I suddenly realized what I was mentioning to you before, that the, the person who made, or the group that made that bead it was, is a secret society, was the leaders of the Shumash, right? Their name is Antop. It's spelled A-N-T-A-P. Well, Op, Op, A-P in Shumash means house. So when I realized that, I said, wait, okay, I got part of the clue here. It's something house. But I didn't know what. Okay, and then I was reading, I don't know what else I was reading, and the, the name An, or Anu, came up again, and they, and they equate Anu. <laughs> An, An, and Anu, and Osiris, and Orion, they're all the same person. This is the thing I've learned about uh, Native Americans out here in New England. The leaders had sometimes five or six names. So then it kind of dawned on me, uh, it, uh, wait a minute. It, the, it literally translates to the house of On, or Anu, or Orion. And I thought, God, that makes perfect sense. You know, I mean, they're, they're the priests of the house of Orion. And that's why they spoke a completely separate language, and they only spoke that language to each other. They never spoke it in front of the general public. It, it, it's just bizarre. And, and are they what you would call the Anunnaki? They could be, because it starts with on. Yeah, it's very, they, or let's put it this way, a priesthood of on certainly is not an Anunnaki. If, if Anu is the god, then the priesthood would be, they serve the house of Anu, because he's a royal house. It's a royal house. I found the same thing out here. There's a royal house, Poconoke. And um, I, I actually got to be friends out here with one of the last chief shaman of the Poconoke Nation. I mean, they've suffered really badly, Alfred. You know how that is. I know you, you're very keenly aware of it, but most people don't understand. The pilgrims were fine. It was when the Puritans came in. And actually, before that, there was a, there was a, the genocide started with the French. And they were based in Canada, but what the, what the Jesuit order did was that they, they, they infected blankets with smallpox, and they sent it, they, or so they, they traded for it, and they sent it down here. They called it the white man's scourge, and it wiped out a huge portion. It was, it was biological warfare. They were softening up the target. They came in, and they, they, then they, they committed warfare. They blamed, they, they blamed the natives for being savages, you know, and uh, essentially stole their land, destroyed their culture, um, outlawed their religion, if you want to call it that. But the reason it's important is because um, the, the Poconoke people had been visited by the star people, like you can just imagine, right? And um, there's a portal here. There is a portal. There's lots of portals all over the planet, but there is a portal here, and there's a being 
who came through that portal and literally transformed these people, or let's say upgraded them. So he, he has a presence here that most people are unaware of. And um, they, they've, it's really strange to me that, that there's a similarity between the people, the native tribes of, of the East Coast and the West Coast. I guess it shouldn't be that surprising, but it, it's, I, the, 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 the thread for me is that I've experienced both now. Most people think they're just gone, but in fact they're still here. And they have a great deal of knowledge uh, that they don't typically share with, pe you know, the Western civilization because uh, it's it's just a little too painful. They've been so badly abused. But um, sorry, I think I'm getting off the track here. Well, well, no, but but uh, uh, the, you've you've actually gone broad stroke. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. This is what he told me. I got. It. Remember, we've talked a lot about the archons. Yeah. Okay. So, my friend Don, he is the he is what you would call uh, out here the Massasoit, which means the great leader. He's also an Omskamikian. Uh, that is, he's a direct descendant of the the great being of light that came through the portal and helped his people, his family. Um, to to have a, a greater awareness of the creator and their role in creation. Um, so he told me recently because we were we've talked about a lot of things, including the archons. And 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 I guess that's what I was trying to lead up to. The reason, as yes, you and I have talked about, the reason things are really not good on this planet is yes, we've had devastation, but we've also had an infestation of these parasites. Uh, you know that some call the not the the, uh, the archons. So. He gave me a suggestion or a advice, I guess. You, he says, you can, ch you can change the dynamic of the relationship by doing this thing, which is acknowledge them and say, and, and, and only feed them your negative energy on your terms. Sort of like, you know, like a dog will, you know, become obedient when you feed it, but, you know, only, it, you only feed it if it's obedient, right? It's so pretty soon it becomes obedient. You can train these things. And in the process, um, what happens is, you know how, how sometimes if you're angry, you, it's like a dark cloud is just lingering. You have a hard time letting it go. He suggested, he says, if you feel that energy, consciously tell them, you can have this. I don't want it. But don't bother me. Don't be coming up behind me and nipping at my heels and trying to secretly, you know, provoke me into feeding you. Because I'm not going to do that. If you're going to stick around... This is the, these are the rules. These are my rules. I will feed you this stuff because I don't want it. You apparently want it. You need it. And those are my terms. Yeah. If you don't like it, if you don't like it, leave. And I, got to, I know this sounds really crazy, but I've tried it, and it really, really works. So that's number one technique. The, the, an, another technique was given to me by a healer in England is uh, to... Measure your heartbeat at the moment, okay? Find whatever it is, okay? However you are, I would assume that you're in a place of where you're calm and not being disturbed by anything. So measure your beat, count either one, two, three, in and breathe, or one, two, three, out. So in other words, you're synchronizing your breathing to your heartbeat. And what that does is because there's the majority of the electrical energy in our body is going through our, to feed our heart, not the brain. Okay, the three centers of the brain, the heart, and the and the the stomach, those are the main energy sources. But the the heart is really the, where most of the the energy is coming in, and, you know, pumping through. So, a lot of times because we're being provoked by the archons and all and their minions through media, right? Um, and their mims, I guess you call them. The, the it, it throws us out of our, our our natural rhythm for our heart which makes us kind of in an unbalanced state. So this is sort of resetting things back to a natural balance. It's very simple, but you need to do it more than once. And you'll start to feel, or I've started to feel, not only calmer, but I could actually feel the blood flowing, uh, increased circulation. I mean, I could literally feel each pulse. The more you do it, the more sensitive you become to it. And the, and the more calm you remain, which again, that means they don't get the food. They, 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 you're much. It's you're, 
it's much harder for them to provoke you. The final clue that I got recently about dealing with these archons is from a Catholic perspective, which is, it says that if you have an obsession, which most everybody does, has at least one thing they're obsessed with, okay, in life, whatever it is, food, money, sex, you name it, okay, but if, find, do a self-audit, audit, be honest, find what it is that you obsess over, because that obsession leads to possession. And I'm surprised I've never heard this before, but whatever, it just came up recently. Um, the, you know, the Catholics know a lot about this, but they're, and they're supposedly trying to do stuff through exorcism. But honestly, I think a basic education to the world would make this, this problem resolve itself very quickly. And it, those are just three steps that I've learned recently. I don't know what else comes next, but those are, those are three really good things. It's free. Try it out for yourself. It works great, you know. If it doesn't, I'm sorry, but I, I'm just trying to help, okay? Right, right. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Deconstructing the archons. <laughs> well, changing the dynamic. Changing the dynamic. Excellent. So that we are empowering ourselves. We're not waiting on government or, or, or religion or whatever to do it for us or extraterrestrials. I mean, I do think there is going to be some sort of intervention at some point. But that doesn't mean we should just sit around and do nothing. In the meantime, we have to do something to assist ourselves to lead a better life on, every day and, and be good to each other despite, you know, the, in fact, I, the reason I say there's, I feel there's going to be an intervention is because not only is this current system we live in unsustainable, but it was never ever, des this universe was not designed that way. It's not for, designed to self-destruct. It's supposed to be sustainable, life-giving, and more importantly, um, constantly evolving to the next state of being. And that's not happening here. Right, right. Now, yeah. let's move on to the, under, to the underwater portion of the ruins. Okay. And um, we'll put the... Um, the uh, link there, uh, there'll be a link uh, to uh, the ancient ruins under the Pacific Ocean. Yep. Uh, and could you tell a bit about how you came across these, just what, what your history was of becoming aware of this? You say that in, you were already aware of them back in 2010. Well, that's when I first used Google Maps, the Google Earth map, and saw that for the first time, and I thought, wow, that's got to be connected to the ruins somehow. I didn't equate it with UFOs, uh, although it has the shape of a UFO. I mean, a, an oval shape like a UFO, some UFOs, I should say. Um, uh, you know, and I actually pinned that on Google Map in 2010 and named it the platform, but when they updated the maps in 2012, it was gone. And then they updated it again in 2014, and that's when people started noticing, because the images are slightly different every time they do it. Now, you've you got to understand, too, that's not a photograph. Those are actually scans, sonar scans, under the water that the Navy has conducted. And by the way, the Navy has a nuclear submarine base right next door to that platform. Okay, so, some people are trying to tell me that that's just a sea mount. I've never seen a... Find another one on, under the ocean that looks like that, and, uh, and I'll take it all back, you know, but I can't find one. Never seen a sea mount that looks like that. Not even close. Anyway, the, the Navy at Point Magoo, or Point Wainini, Port Wainini, I think is what they call it, is just a little bit up the street from Point Magoo. And if you, if you look at the map, it's spelled M U. G U Mu Gu. You look at these ma the uh, where I grew up in Malibu was Zuma Beach, right? It's actually they pronounce it Sumu, S U M U. So again, you see this thing coming up. One of the elders that I uh, that I met along my travels in Malibu was Grandfather Seimu. Okay, so there's a. There's definitely a carryover there from that memory or that time of those people, the people of the Mu, or the, if you want to call them the Mu, whatever. Um, and it, so, 
uh, sorry, that object is something that I kind of suspected was there because um, a lot of people have seen the UFOs, and I wrote an article about it, which was heavily plagiarized. After that thing, everybody said, there's a UFO base in Malibu. Uh, they just grabbed my article about UFOs in Malibu, and they just started posting it all over the, the Internet with, you know, without my name on it, which I thought was weird, but okay, fine. I'm glad people are paying attention. Uh, it wasn't just me. There's a lot of people in the, in, over the years that have seen these things, sometimes going in and out of the water. Um, you know, part of the thing that I, I had a, a very strong in, intuition about it was that um, after meeting this being of light, so-called father, uh, a few weeks later I had a lucid dream where I was back out in my home, the home I grew up in, in Malibu, and I was looking out at the, at the ocean, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and um, I remember feeling really glad to be there, you know, it was like, Wonderful to be home, even though that wasn't real. I, I didn't live there anymore. And as, suddenly, something got my attention. I looked up, and there was three UFOs coming out of the east, and they were silver-colored as they flew over the house. And they went in directly into the water. And I was shocked. I was very excited when I saw that. Uh, and then uh, moments later, they came popping back out of the water, and now they're golden, and they passed right back over the house at that point. I'm freaking out. I, I, I yelled at the house. I'm going, Dad, Dad, come check out the UFOs. You know, There's a flash of light, and there's this guy standing there again. The same, it looked like the same guy that I saw up in the mountains. And, and at, this, at that point, I just didn't even question. I walked over, and I hugged him, and, and I woke up. I mean, it, it's got to be a pretty profound dream for you to wake up. And it was, it, it, was, it was that startling waking up feeling again, like just, just like when I first saw him on the mountains. I was jolted awake, you know. And uh, although, I, like I said, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember really falling asleep that, that night up in the mountains. You know, I was, I was just fully awake. And the next thing I know, I'm sitting up. Uh, I mean, I didn't really think I ever fell asleep, Okay. I knew I was out of my body, but I, in any case, here's the, I told you this before, but it's so weird, Alfred. At least two people saw me that night in their, what they call dreams, that I was, that I came to them in their bedroom. And they described it very, very clearly. The first lady said, I took her out of her bedroom up to the mountains, which I, Look, I didn't make this up. I didn't tell her anything. She, this was the very next day. She says to me, yeah, you came, I, you came to my room. You took me up into the mountains. You taught me how to fly. And then you brought me back to my room. And she said, I think this has something to do with spirituality. I read that in a psych class, you know, one time. And I'm looking at her just going, that's crazy. Again, it doesn't make any sense to me at the time. After I got home from work that day, the phone was ringing, and it was my grandmother. She says to me, Robbie, I saw you at the foot of my bed last night, and she says, you were saying something to me, and for the life of me, I can't remember what it was, because you were all lit up like a Christmas tree. She said, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. She says, I just had to tell you that. And I'm like, oh, my God. I, you know, it's like one crazy, shocking thing after another. You know, it's, 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 it, talk about overload. And no place to really, there was very little context for any of this stuff, honestly, I, yeah, I've i struggled with this for a long time, okay? And I know you and I have talked about it, but I'm really putting all my cards on the table now because I really think that um, there's a lot of people that need to know. Not it, This isn't just happening to me. There's people all over the planet that are having experiences like this, and, and um, it's not an anomaly whatsoever. We are all connected as a, a family of souls, energetically, consciously, spiritually, we're all related to the Creator and all this creation. This, this is our inheritance, you know. And a lot of that has been taken away from us. And you know, at some point, whether the destruction was natural or then augmented by, you know, negative extraterrestrials, the archons. Uh, that I, I should make the distinction. These parasites not only infect human beings, but they have a affected or infected certain extraterrestrials not just reptilians or whatever I, that's silly that's it's like cowboys and indians it's not that simple uh, that when people talk like that oh you know reptilians bad and humans good no you look at humans humans are capable of <laughs> great evil to, 
uh, unspeakable evil. So it's um, important to know that the parasite itself is very uh, weak, but because they work together and they influence us and our cousins, our extended family, uh, some of the, the extraterrestrials are crazy. They're possessed. You know, and they do great harm, even though that wasn't how they were originally designed. That's not what their true function in life is. Um, so there's a lot of healing that needs to be done here. And I, I really feel by, by coming forward and telling everybody this story or this, inf this, this information, these series of events that have occurred to me, I'm sort of t helping to tell the story of mankind uh, and how we got into the mess we're in right now and how we can move beyond that and really begin to heal uh, our, our family. That, that's, that's the purpose of this. Right. And, and you really have brought the message of the Archons forward in a very graphic way mm. and tied it, I think, to things like the exoarchaeological exo discoveries that you're making. Mm. Things like the exopolitical research and discovery that you made in your two books on yeah. extraterrestrials in Washington, D.C., where you tied that into the yeah. archonic influence there. Yeah. So I really want to acknowledge that. Oh, thanks. But, you know, Alfred, I, I can't take really, uh, thank you, but I can't take credit for this because uh, it, in a lot of ways, when I look back on this, it feels like it was a setup. Uh, that they were, uh, that the good guys, or however you want to look at it, that uh -huh. <laughs> this is a giant chessboard we're on here, and a lot and of us are being pushed. Being pushed. <laughs> yeah, and, and right. some people are really uncomfortable. Knight, not, knight to bishop, uh, yeah. is that it? <laughs> well, some people are saying, oh, that's a violation of our free will. Well, yeah, okay, but the negatives, the archons, are already violating our free will, and they don't care about it. That's why, I'll summarize it this way. This planet was terraformed into a paradise planet by benevolent beings long time ago and then fairly recently it coinciding with this destruction we were in a weakened state and the the negative archon influenced alien extraterrestrial came in here and took over and turned it into a prison planet and that's what we've been living under for right. you know a period of time uh, and that's why uh, my understanding is that the benevolent ones always said they were going to come back and put things back into order, uh, you know, uh, and that's just serving the creator's plan. I mean, it's a, yeah, you know, yeah. somebody, somebody said God's an artist, so why are we doing all this destruction? If we're, if we're really children of God, why do we do such destructive things? And it's, it's not a small question, okay, because the implications of all this are is we have we're, uh, we're divine beings that are in a very uh, suffering through a very uh, harrowing situation and that there has to be some resolution to this conflict, this sickness. I, as I said, evil is an infection. If I'm right, and I think I am, um, I cannot say that this was all my idea. Alfred, I'm attacked by the Archons. I go to the mountain, I meet this being of light, then I, I'm literally going back to see him, that's when I find the ruins, and then after that, all this UFO contact just keeps happening, you know? And I knew that some, somehow, um, I could have said no to all this, I think, I think I could have, well, I, but I didn't, I didn't, and uh, there's an end result of those steps add up to it's 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 an equation you know it's says right. like there's realization there's a there is a, a number <laughs> that you get when you add these together okay and it has a value but it's not for me personally no it no I, I yes it, yeah but still you you did make a choice you maintained awareness yeah and and you were aware of w w what's happening and and you, uh, you know, you brought all all of that forward, and and so you you did give us a great gift, which was Thanks. the discovery that that you brought back, and yeah. and uh, I 
I, I, there, there's still one more item that yeah. I that I kind of want to cover. Go ahead. Be, because we have not gone into the kind of the nitty gritty of the underground of the under uh, water uh, site, which I kind of like to because I'm, I'm really curious about it. If we go down and kind of scroll down, there's an area. It, it kind of looks like the area of the face on Mars, you know, <laughs> where you've got this sort of a big square and then you've got a bunch of other places down there. Oh, you're and, talking about, yeah, that's the South Pacific. That's not Malibu. Oh, oh, I thought that, that, that was No, Malibu. you remember, did you, okay, I sent you an article about a portal in the Pacific. Oh, oh, these, no, but they, they, this is under the same link as, I know. as I Underground know. Ruins. Yeah, because, okay, in 2010, I found that anomaly, the platform, in Malibu. Oh. In 2013, I was writing an article about a Navy pilot that went into a, a a green fog, and and actually he ended up on another world entirely, another Earth. He didn't know that at the time. Okay, he thought he was just lost. It's an incredible story. And now, the, the, is this the one with Howland Island and Baker yes, Island? Yes, Howland Baker and Starbuck Island. It's where you know that's where Howland Island is supposedly where Amelia Earhart went missing. Mm -hmm. that's the current narrative. I don't know where she is. Okay, there's a lot of theories about it. But in 1974, July 4th, my friend was flying a uh, experimental, or I should say a newly introduced uh, F-14 into the fleet. And he was doing test runs in the Pacific. And they vectored him into this area near Starbuck Island. He saw a green fog ahead of him, didn't think much of it. He was going very fast, so he just figured, you know, blow right through it. He lost both engines and radio contact. He had to make an emergency landing. Fortunately, there was an island down below. Unfortunately, it wasn't on a map. Now, how is that possible? In 1974, everything was, I would assume, was mapped. Okay? It's not like Gilligan's Island. Okay? This thing was pretty big. It should have been on a map. And there was people there, and they were very intelligent, but unique, very unique people. And uh, they, they welcomed him in. He lived there for six months until they could see he was depressed. And then they said, it's time for you to go. And he's like, wait a minute. I told you when I first got here, I needed to contact my commanding officer and get out of here. And they're like, okay, whatever. It's time for you to go. And they put, he had an emergency raft with his gear and stuff. And they put him in there and then they attached him to their canoes and they took him out past the reef and then they let him go and they said, well, you're going to be fine out here. He's like, I'm going to die out here. What do you mean? I could get, I, I had no radio contact whatsoever on your island. They said, don't worry, you'll be fine. You know, we will see you again, you know. So they start paddling back to the island and he says, as he's watching them going, he's thinking, I'm just going to die. He says, suddenly the whole island vanished in a fa flash of light. There was kind of a, a, a whooshing sound, like a little bit of air blowing past him, and it was, it was gone. The island was gone. The reason it was gone is because he was now back on the other side of the portal, or a portal that was there. I'm sure of that now. There's no, there's no magical invisible island out in the Pacific. It's, everything about it is just it, it's astonishing to me. You know, I know I have two friends that have gone through portals and come back. Jerry Wills is the other one. I talked to Jerry about this, and he was shocked. He was so shocked, but he started he started giving me all this information. Oh, I know about those islands and you know all these portals and stuff. And and as I'm researching that, I actually found an article in the Associated Press about uh, in two, last year, 2013, a Coast Guardsman who was off duty in Hawaii uh, had gone missing. He was missing for six weeks. They looked at land, sea, and air. Okay, they, they they covered a huge area looking for him. His car was found abandoned on a beach, a remote beach on Oahu. He shows up six weeks later. They said he was incoherent. Well, whatever he was telling them probably sounded like you know, you're nuts. What do you you, you must have hit your head? Where have you been? You know, what do you say to that? Oh, I was I was you know. <laughs> I was in a magical land. I mean, whoa! That okay. So they put him in the hospital. 
He calls his base commander. They have him transferred over to Pearl Harbor, which is the same place they took my friend when he, after he, oh, I should have told you, I'm sorry. After they vanished, he picked up, what else could he do? He picked up his emergency radio and he sent out a signal. It was picked up by an AWAC. They then sent an a, a emergency signal to a nearby fishing vessel to pick him up, which then rendezvoused with a naval ship that took him back directly to Pearl Harbor where he was debriefed for two weeks. He could tell that the civilian team of suits that were questioning him, he could tell that they knew a lot more than they were. They weren't telling him anything. They were trying to get information. But during the course of this, he could tell that they knew the, the questions they were asking, that they knew about this place. In fact, he said he feels like they actually sent him in on purpose to see what would happen. He, he wasn't the only one. You know, if you look at the records, a lot of people go missing and they never come back. And a lot of times they're in a ship or a plane over water. Like the Devil's Triangle in Japan, that place is officially off limits. They, they sent a boat full of uh, scientists, 300 scientists, vanished without a trace. The whole ship, it's gone. It's never been seen again. So, um, like I said, I, that's why I was looking around Baker Island and Starbuck Island. I was looking, just looking at the maps, right? And with Google Earth, you can see this, the, the, the ocean floor somewhat. It's not super clear, okay? A lot of times they do uh, low-definition scans for public and high-definition scans of only... If you look closely, you'll see where there's very great detail and then there's sort of... It's fuzzy. It's not because there's, it's, the technology is bad. They do that on purpose. So anyway, the bottom line is there's a massive, complex, ancient, megalithic buildings... Uh, probably from Lemuria. I can't imagine what else it would be. And there, that's what those other pictures are, the second half of the, 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 that page. And what else is bizarre is those holes, those black holes on those buildings are a mile wide. They do not look like volcanic vents. Wow. I know. That's what I said. When I first saw it, I'm like, damn. How did anybody miss that thing? I mean, it's not that far under the water, relatively speaking, and it's humongous. You can't miss it. Um, and the holes, I don't know who did that or why, but they are, they're so deep and so perfectly straight down that there's no light coming out. There's no light reflecting off of it at all. So who knows? Maybe that is an entrance. Maybe it was a blast hole. It doesn't look like a meteorite hit it. You know, those, those things kind of mushroom out. They're not, like, perfectly excised whole. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm just looking at this, and, and this, is the, this is the underwater structure. And you've got it labeled platform, but, yeah. but, but you have a friend who actually has been told otherwise. Could, yeah. could you tell us that, that particular yeah. story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. I have had multiple close encounters at that location, mostly at night, but not always. Sometimes it's happened during the daytime there. In fact, when it happened during the daytime, the Navy actually scrambled two jets to intercept. And there was like almost, there must have been almost a million people down at Zuma Beach that day. And they were all watching it. Anyway, yeah, it happens. It really does happen. Uh, but so I called this this old friend of mine in Malibu, and he said uh, that yeah he, he his when he asked about his spiritual mentor he said what is that thing because I guess he'd seen it on a map drawn on a map it's literally some of these old maps of the ocean floor for I guess for people that dive you know they they've got the the different reefs and stuff that's it's drawn in there so they've known about it for a long time anyway he says to me he go he says he was told that that's actually a large ship starship that's parked. On the ocean floor there. Amazing. And he says he's, he, over the years, he's a ham radio operator. He says he's got a very sophisticated ham radio set up on his property and that he actually was getting signals in the 12 millimeter band that shouldn't be there in, in daytime and nighttime. And, and uh, so I have all the technical details. He's sending me a CD of these recordings of these sounds. So I'm going to, when I can, I'll, I'll, I'll post them. I'll send a copy. You can link up to oh, it. Great. Yeah, it's just, like I said, I have a feeling where this story isn't over yet. There's probably no, no, no. more. And, and, and so when we do get that sound, and if there is yeah. something there, we're going to have yeah. to have a follow-up on that. Because yeah. if that is a spaceship, park there. Yeah. 
that's signaling out now, whether that's on autopilot or some kind of, you know, beamer signal. Yeah. I mean, there's a story going on there. Yeah. You know, Mr. Allen in Washington, D.C. is also, he's upgraded his equipment and he's doing this great audio at night. And he's also got a, a, a microphone now and he's actually getting... He's getting not only visual, but he's getting audio coming into the camera, and you can see it correlate with the movement of these ships. I've never heard sound coming off of the ships before like that, and wow. uh, yeah, it's it's bizarre. This is this is Will Allen of yeah. UFO DC. Yes, and he he lives seven blocks from the White House, and he's been putting on a, on a tripod at night. He mounts the camera and he points it straight up over the house. And, and just lets it run. And then later he'll, he'll go through it and, and, and look for anomalies. And it happens almost every time he puts the camera. And you know what else is weird? I don't know if he told you this, but there's been five or six times in the past couple of years where his cameras have been um, attacked remotely through an energy beam. He said, he said it, it fried the motherboard uh, on these cameras, which he said he couldn't understand. It's in a titanium uh, body. It's, the, the energy shouldn't be getting through like that. And he says, also, the, the shutter looked like it was crushed. And then I, I started thinking about it. The last time it happened, I go, wait a minute. I remembered the Hutchison effect, where they can just melt, you know, solid pieces of metal. It just melts like butter. I thought, oh my God, somebody beamed energy in there, melted his camera, and then when it cooled, it looked like it was crushed. But there's no way it could have been crushed, you know? It was inside. So he keeps doing it, though. He keeps, even though it's his ruined these cameras, he keeps sending it back to Nikon. They keep rebuilding it. He keeps putting it back up there. And it, it's, it's astonishing the frequency of, of, of events that are going on right there in, in, in the nation's capital. Now, back, back, to this, back to this, quote, platform, yeah. this, quote, For Ruin because it's very different from the the um, the sort of iconic shape of the Buddha head and oh, no. and the Brahma head. This has the the iconic shape of a spaceship. It does, you know. And let's speculate. And and if this was say covered up by by the uh, by the solar system catastrophe, we don't know, but it looks like maybe it was a single event that covered all of this up. I'm just trying to figure out why would that spaceship have been covered up at at this time? I mean, couldn't get off the ground, or I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. It's, it's, we really could only speculate, but whatever it is, it's very, has a very strong integrity because there's no yeah. erosion the the material that's stuck to it you know here's the other thing we're really looking we're not looking at a photograph we can't see exactly what the surface of that thing is all we can see is that it's perfectly geometrical it doesn't look eroded at all whatsoever when, when people this year 2014 when they first started saying oh it's a ufo base i said no it's not there's a portal there for sure because i, I told you my friends and i we've seen the ufos coming and going sometimes they stop and beam a light on us right there right. but it's the same thing i said about washington dc we've got a picture of a portal near the capitol building that night in 2002 july they don't need to have a base underground in order to come through those portals as opposed to portals right so I, well, yeah yeah, so we still don't know. We don't know. We don't know what that structure is. No, but it is definitely not natural. People have tried yeah. to tell me that, and I say, then show me another natural formation on Earth that is that symmetrical. I've never seen one. And again, yeah. because of the, if you look at the angle, it's perfectly flat on top. Yeah. And then the, the sides are so smooth. It's like, where's the erosion? Yes, yeah, the yeah. currents are slow underneath the water there, but everywhere around it is eroded. Yeah. It just doesn't doesn't make sense. Yeah, good. Well, I'm you know, thank you again for okay. and and you actually have been studying this before the recent flap that kind of brought it to public pro to public prominence and yeah yeah be, because you you actually tagged this yep in in actually 2010 and then 
you tagged it, and then apparently USGS took your tags off. <laughs> was well, that no, it? Google, Google. When oh, they Google. Their, see, I was using a 2009 Google map, yeah. of, uh, right, from Navy data. Yeah. Then in 2012, they updated it, and my PIN and the, you know my my ID yeah, was gone. Was gone. I I didn't think about that, but and I had done screen captures of the Google map. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't feel a need to post that because I I didn't think it was that big a deal. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Okay, but when these guys, some guys out in, in California, when they saw that, I, I think they they kind of just jumped the gun a little bit and. I'll tell you something else that the, whatever Google's doing with the Navy data, you can see where they're kind of uh, covering up some spots on it. It's not as clear as it was in 2009, and I think even 2012. There's areas of it now that are obscured. Yeah. The data is being obscured, uh, so it's right. it's, 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 it's so there's a lot of gray areas. But I think we're getting close to something, some sort of revelation. Yeah, yeah, good, good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, let's move on then. Okay. You know, it, it, a lot of this stuff doesn't make a lot of sense, Alfred. I mean, there's, I've always had more questions than answers, and this is what actually has motivated me to be so-called researcher. I'm honestly, I've just been trying to figure it out for myself. But I've come to realize that part of the deal is I don't get information unless I promise to share it with interested parties. Um, I found that to be the case. If I hold on to something, then there's it sort of shuts off the flow of information to me personally. And I'll remind you again in this audience, the reason I came up with this awareness about the Archons uh, in, and started publicizing it in 2011, um, not only because it coincided with my research in Washington, D.C., but honestly, I couldn't figure this out. I was absolutely perplexed. What is going on here? What is who, What are these parasites? What is it? What's the bigger picture? Is I couldn't find it anywhere in a book. It was nowhere. And so I mentally tried to connect with that being of light, the Father, and I asked him to help me. I said, if you want me to do this, can you please help me? And that's when the clues started to come, one after another, after another, after another. And that's when I realized, oh, my God, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't my imagination. This is real. And... And here is evidence. No, in fact, here's some photographs. And, and, and it just kept like a snowball down a hill. That's, that's how it happened. <laughs> Strange but true, man. I could yeah, make it. No, 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 right. And, <laughs> and, and, and so this, the, as you stated, this is all part of a great cosmic surfacing that seems yeah. to be surfacing after a period from the great solar system catastrophe of 11,500 years ago. Yeah. And I have seen analysis where <clears throat> you, you can say that the, the fragment of the Vela supernova, oh, well, that's just a matter of catastrophe, but that that was lobbed into our yeah. solar system and teleguided by yeah. those negative forces that wanted to, uh, you know, it's part of, it's like when you go to invade part of a solar system, you know, or you invade a country, you always bombard it. Yes. Well, they, they bombarded us with a fragment of a supernova. It, it, I've often thought that, I, and I've heard other people speculate that. It's, it's, very, it's very possible, and yeah. it, it may not even been from a supernova. It could have just been directed from the Oort cloud. It would be very, very simple to do something like that. You know, the other thing is that that planet that used to be beyond Mars is now an asteroid belt. So that was utterly destroyed. Right. If you look at the so-called Ring of Lyra, uh, and, you know, again, I don't know that we... It's based on channeled information, but supposedly that was an entire solar system that was obliterated during so-called warfare. But why? Why would you obliterate your own solar system like that and then move off to do more damage? That was part of the big conundrum in my mind is uh, how, well, why? Well, they, they, it was part of the Lucifer Rebellion, ah, i.e., th this was a universe-wide war Apparently between so. the creator of the universe 
and a rebel, a series of rebel angels. Yeah. And they're cornered here now. Guy well, named Satanas, Satan. I, I, I agree. I agree with you, but there's a there's a twist to that is what as what I I came to understand after reading this one book. It was written by a friend of my dad. His name's Norman Paulson. He's deceased now. He started Sunburst. Um but he originally wrote this book called Sunburst, The Return of the Ancients, or what he called the Builders. Okay. They were the, the divine ones. So, but he had said that they went crazy. At some point they became, some of them literally went crazy and became evil when they went into a region of space that was forbidden to them. Right, right. Okay. He talked about that. Yeah. And no, see, nobody, nobody does talk about this, but it's sort of a metaphor for the garden sort of thing. The, the, you know, it was a paradise until, right? So I think what they did was entered a wormhole that took them to a very dark region or a very demented place where these parasites were. Because, you know, here's the thing. I've traveled on ships a lot. You go to a foreign port, the first thing that happens is the rats trying to come on board, and they're usually carrying diseases. And I believe the same thing happened to, well, we know that this is the thing about possession. These things, or even, no, honestly, you're not even just... Physically, when a parasite infects a human being or another life form, they, go, they, they behave like they're crazy, right? It's totally illogical, the things they do, including suicide. So, um, and that's all because the parasite is taking control of their, of their uh, functions. And um, uh, so, that's what, that was part of the clue. I'd read that book so many times, Sunburst, Return of the Agents. He even rewrote it with his, his new wife, and um, uh, now he called it Christ Consciousness. Okay, so I read that book, and then I had to go back. I also had read all of Castaneda's books, which are highly controversial, but, you know, it was influential on me. And, and I, even though I read the, the last one many times, that when he talked about the flyers, those, those parasitic things, um, I, it, didn't, it didn't register until I was ready for it. And then it was like, oh my God! It was like the, the the key in the lock, you know. It's it was part of the part of the key in there, and it just turned, and suddenly it I, I could see it now. I could see the storyline and and tell people how I I really think it happened. Some of our ancestors ventured out of the solar whatever our galaxy, our universe, became infected by these parasites. They went insane they came back and they started to i mean according to what norman said this is based on his contact with human extraterrestrials that that originally set up the colonies of mu here they were attacked by their own kind who had gone insane and i was trying to, to reconcile how did they go insane they went to a place it's you know there was forbidden uh that did that wasn't the whole story there was a there was a piece a very important piece was missing and castanatus was the one that helped me see it he wasn't, it didn't end there, you know, obviously I had, a, I got a lot of information from people like Credo Mutua and also the, you know, these different shamans from Australia and here in New England and, you know, I mean, it is, pieces of the puzzle are scattered all over the place, okay. Um, but I think we can definitively say, and obviously the Gnostics, the Gnostics, clearly, the Gnostic shaman seers, they, they tried to tell us and they suffered greatly for it, that's why they were obliterated. And their writings were destroyed, and you know, fortunately, some of it survived. But you know, look, I, I would have never seen those things that day if I wasn't in a um, altered state of consciousness. And that was because that that um, <laughs> that that boy was bleeding to death, and his parent, his grandparents were freaking out, and it was the adrenaline was just pumping in me, and it was such a surreal moment that that's how at that moment. And I saw them in the room floating up on the ceiling like that. I just went, what? I, I, again, I thought, I thought I was just imagining it. I thought, you know, it was just, whoa, that was strange, you know. And I did, then I just, you know, okay, let's clean up the glass and let's do this. I mean, uh, I'd already called the paramedics. But th when I saw those things, I'm like, Jesus, that, what is that? And then it just vanished. And I'm thinking, that, 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 whoa, that, that can't be real, you know. Uh, but as I was talking to the grandmother, and she's still telling me that she thought that her grandson thought he could fly. 
And that's how he's that's how come he ran through the, the door. He he was actually gonna just jump off of the deck of the second story. She said he probably would have killed himself. And I'm like, that's when that's when I my hair stood up. I could feel it, you know, the hair on the back of my neck stood up because I'm like, oh my God, those things somehow I knew in that state of consciousness that those things were whispering into that boy's mind, telling him that he could fly. Yeah. I mean it's it's like like I said, it was I was it was all an instinct. Now I can say it to you more logically because I've done my homework and and compared um, my experience to so many other people's experiences and all these different cultures from different times. They all correlate with one another until you come to like I said. There's a uh, you know there, this is this is an equation. It adds up right. to something, right? Exactly. So yeah, no, no, no. I I understand, and in fact. It may be that uh, many uh, conditions that we call, quote, mental illness may in fact be archonic infestation. Specifically schizophrenia. And if you've yeah. listened to my conversations with this mental health professional, Dr. J, that's not his real name, he has to remain anonymous right now because in the mental health field, you cannot talk about <laughs> entities, non-physical entities officially don't exist, okay? But he based the reason he contacted me is because he he definitely knew that I knew something that he discovered thirty years ago when he was working in prisons with with uh, violent criminals. A lot of them were drug addicts, especially he said um, meth amphetamine was one of the things that really caused them to have a deep relationship with these these parasites. He gave me some fan fantastic examples of this so again um, he was trying to say to me hey you're right keep going is is there any way that we can work together on this and <laughs> when I boy when I agreed to do that I first I said sure I'll help you whatever I mean I figured you know any help is better than nothing man they started attacking me hard I mean crazy the stuff they were trying to do to me and um, sometimes successfully to the point where I said, uh, hey, I'm sorry, I am being attacked so heavily by these things right now, worse than ever in my life. They really don't want me to work with you. I'm going to have to, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to back away from this, writing a book with you on this. And uh, however, you know, we did shows together and we we do correspond. So we are still in league together, but... Right. Yeah. Now, um... Uh, I just want to segue with okay. that word. Yeah. Uh, and the word was book. Yeah. Because obviously, and I'm sure this is going through your mind, and here we are right in the middle of, of a discovery process, but this merits a book. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're you're yeah. just now putting it up on the website, but I mean, really to gather all of this in one place. Do you plan a book on this subject? As I said before, I've written this up as a novel, right? Um, but I've always struggled with: is that the right format? Do I really want to pretend like this is just entertainment for people? I could sugarcoat it like that, but I'm not sure that I want to, honestly. No, I. I mean, if you want my honest opinion, uh -huh. I think you've got to write it as nonfiction as as you write. It, it, it's in the line with your other books. I mean, okay. yeah, that, it, that, it is that that's well, my honest opinion. And I've, yeah. you know, and I've and I've read chapters from chapters from your novel on this. But yeah. that's it's all fancy. But the novel is just a thin veneer for my yeah. real life. OK, yeah, I just yeah. uh, but. Here's, here is a very funny thing about artistic license. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to finish. I wanted, I, how do you end the story if it's your, it's your life? I'm not dead, so how do I, how do I put a, a you know, no, what would be the no. appropriate ending to it? No, hang on. Listen, oh. I, I couldn't figure out how to end the novel. It's my life. I'm not dead. Where do I end it? Where is the actual resolution to this problem? Okay. So once again, I was stuck, and I asked this being mentally, the father, can you show me the future, or at least one possible future, of how this all plays out? Where is the resolution to this conflict going? 
And then things got really interesting. Okay, because it, it's like channeling, you know, you're just open to whatever, right? And it, it doesn't happen instantly. A lot of times I'll be totally thinking about something else and then, wow, it just like you start seeing it in your head and I'm writing it down going, oh my God, that's really interesting, you know? That would, yeah, that would be a great, that, not a, it's not, okay, it's a happy ending. Let's put it that way. Everybody gets, you know, it, it's, it's a good ending for everybody, okay? And I thought, but you see, it's so plausible too. It's so that was the other thing. It's not like contrived whatsoever. I feel like I really did see a possible future for humanity, and it's um, it's 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 wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. So it's gonna it's still gonna be shocking though when it as it ha if it happens like that. Uh, again, I think that's why we're having this conversation is sort of preparing people. Yeah, I mean. I can see how the various elements of this, number one, just the scientific documentation mm. and unearthing and publication of these yeah. artifacts. Yeah. You know, in itself. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And then wrapped around uh, all of the experiences mm. with the from the star map to all of the synchronicities yeah. uh, of how it was found, you know, and then, you know, there, so that you can present this in various l layers in a way that it's all part of are landing a positive timeline rather than the catastrophic timeline. Yeah. Because all the archons have been trying to do is create the 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 create the catastrophic timeline. Right. But they already did that. Yeah. Eleven thousand five hundred years ago. So what we're doing is we're we're just bringing it up and showing, hey, look, this this is what these people did eleven thousand five hundred years ago. Yeah. And we're moving forward positively now. Well, some of our ancestors ended up on a on a parallel earth. That was the thing about the story about the portal that was so again, I wasn't even looking for that. That was another one of those things that they threw at me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like I'm giving these weird assignments and then it, 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 it takes on a life of its own if I get if I even agree to open the thing, it's like, okay, here's the rest of the folder. Now you, you, know, you just digest it and report it. And it, <laughs> the thing about that island, the people there, they were normal. There wasn't any archons on that island. Right. There was, in fact, there wasn't even any parasites on the island. That's what my friend couldn't understand. There wasn't any mosquitoes. There wasn't any rats. Uh, there wasn't trash washing up. I mean, it was just none of it made sense. It couldn't have been an island in the Pacific on our planet. So there's what I'm trying to say is, um, in fact, uh, the, the 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 portal here near me in Rhode Island, um, uh, my shaman friend told me he said <laughs> it's closed now, but before all hell broke loose here, a lot of my family went through that. And I said, did they ever come back? He said, no, they're in a better place right now. <laughs> why would they come back here? Besides, that's why they shut the portal. They went through for a while, and then all hell started breaking loose. They shut it. Uh, it's just, it's just an amazing story. I mean, or not story. These are gigantic revelations that we're not getting from the powers that be, obviously, because it threatens their ability to control us. Uh, but it's important for us to have this information because it, it, it's empowering. It helps us to reconnect with each other and also the cosmos, because. You know, one of the things, the real detrimental things that these archons are doing to us, because everything is, it's all about our consciousness, the, that energy exchange uh, that con we call consciousness. The, the, the physical body that we have right now is like the tip of the iceberg of who we really are. And even if you, you look at just the physical part of us, if, you, if that was turned in back, in, if it was released back into ener its energetic state, it's like it's equivalent to like three hydrogen bombs or something. I mean, it's just a tremendous amount of energy bundled up as so-called matter, right? 
And that's just a little part of who we are, what we are. Uh, as I said before, we're seeds of light. Our soul, whatever you want to call it, is an is a intelligent, living ball of energy, consciousness, okay? And, and, and it's in an ocean of intelligent, living energy that belongs to a much more mature being, okay? But it, it, it birthed us. I mean, like, you know, it, like I said, this is a really organic process, the creation of universes and life, it's, it's not, you know, you understand, you've written a whole book about it, it's the multiverse, right? Each universe is uh, um, an extension of the old one. In other words, a mature soul or seed comes out of that universe, creates a whole other universe, and the process just keeps going like that, you know? The tree drops the seed, the seed matures, and then it drops seed. So it's, in that regard, it's a fractal, holographic fractal. And it's very organic. And, and, you know, whenever our consciousness is altered into a negative state, we literally contract and, and disconnect from all that is. So when you stop and think about it, we're not only connected to an entire universe, that universe is connected to other universes. And so on. It's incredible. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, honestly, I, I, I marvel at this. And I'm, I'm so happy that we're finally getting to this stage where we're having this conversation because that means we're really moving to the next level of being. Right. Right. The I'm dimensional... Sorry. No, no. And, and what you are providing and bringing together here is in yet more empirical evidence of the dimensional ecology mm. that we're in. Yeah. Of of you know these portals, these these um, parallel universes and yeah. civilizations that are living side by side with us. Yeah. In compassion for us. And yeah. Moving along. Well, uh, <laughs> do you, do you have any final? Uh, we we we've, we've come to the end of this segment, but do you have yeah. any? observations that you'd like to leave our viewing audience with and I, how, how, how can people oh. get in touch with your work and yeah. view your work and contact you and okay thank you that. thank you it's very kind of you um uh unicus magazine is the best way to contact me unicus magazine.com it's spelled u-n-i-c-u-s magazine.com and uh there's an email link there and i do answer all my emails uh even the people who like to be confrontational, I st still do my best to be nice to them. Um, uh, but any, in any case, um, thank you again for having me, Alfred. And um, if, if, as, as things develop, I'll certainly keep you informed because you're, you are absolutely doing a great service as well to, to, keep, to help humanity uh, move out of this darkness we're in. And um, I, I, it's hard for me to express how, how excited I am about what I think is coming on for us and um, there will be no limits to what we can create or co-create uh, and um, I envision a time when there is no sickness, no war, no poverty or hunger. Okay? <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> e., yeah, i.e. We're, we're in portal land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Returning to the garden Yes. The, uh, uh, of the paradise as it was originally intended to be. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what I see. That's what I feel in my entire being. And it's coming a lot sooner than some people think. And it has the, um, the archons absolutely <laughs> petrified. They, they, they don't know what to do. They can't deal with it. They just don't know how to deal with it. Archon free zone. There you go. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> that's a, I want that for a bumper sticker. <laughs> Thank oh you so much, and again, we, we, we really have to congratulate you in having brought all of this together uh, in this latest discovery of yours. Thank you very much, Alfred. Indeed. Thank you so much.